All right, so turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, doing a bit of a New Year's Eve message. And so let me just uh, start with this. Uh, I became a believer at the age of 16. And one of the big questions that I had as soon as I committed my life to the Lord is this. What is God's will for my life? Now, I was asking two different levels. I was asking for God's will, like what am I supposed to be doing as a Christian? But then I was also asking, God, I need some guidance, like specific guidance in specific areas. Well, later on in years, I went into the ministry, and I heard that question many, many times. I still hear that question many times from people. And they ask, well, what's God's will for my life? But they're also asking, and they're asking, you know, what should I be doing as a Christian? Or what does that look like? But then they're also asking for guidance in specific areas uh, where they need to make decisions. And, and sometimes we, you know, we, we, we put those two things together and we just generally describe it under the topic, you know, what is God's will for my life? Well, that is a good question. What is God's will for my life? That's a big question. And uh, over the years, I've heard people ask that when it comes, comes to what kind of job they should have or what kind of education they, or training they should pursue. Or, um, and, you know, in my case, whether I should go into the ministry. All right? They apply. Over the years, I have discovered a very simple answer, discovered a very simple approach where God reveals, I would just like to open a fortune cookie, and there it is printed. Okay? Lottery tickets? Did you know that? There's numbers on the back. Six of them, right? All right. Huh? But here's the deal. I wish it was just so quick and easy, but that's not how it, you have to f follow. Man, they're setting you up for a lot of disappointment. And that's been my experience when I've tried to follow formulas. All right? There is no magic formula to the Christian life. There's no easy, just do these three simple steps, poof, like a genie out of a bottle. Everything happens exactly like you think it should every single time. But I have discovered a few scriptures that have helped me and encouraged me to just see this unfolding of God's will and guidance. So, are you ready to hear this this morning? Ready to dive into this, guys? Matthew chapter 6. I want to read something first of all. You've heard it many times, but let's try and listen to it with fresh ears. Matthew chapter 6, verse 28. Um, basically, I'm, I'm kind of jumping into it. Verse 25 is a good place to start. But 28 says, And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. Is that how God... If that, if that is how God clothes the graf, grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not uh, much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble as it, of its own. There is one phraser that jumps out at me, and the phrase is in verse 32. And I, you know, I often read over it quickly, but look at verse 32. It says, The pagans run after these things. The pagans run after these things. The pagans chase after these things. They pursue these things. And there's been times in my life where I have been running with the pagans as a Christian. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I've been pursuing and chasing down the same things that the pagans desire. Now here's the thing. It, it, Jesus talks about worrying. And, and that seems to be a key thing in these verses here. Worry, worry, worry. Worry and fear is the fuel for a lot of people nowadays in how they live their life. Did you know that? They wake up, they worry. During the day, they worry. They go to bed, they worry about their future. They worry about decisions that are confronting them. They worry about how things are going to... They imagine scenarios of how things are going to turn out. And so people are driven by fear and worry deep down in their hearts. Very powerful motivator. Anyways... 
Turn over to 1 Thessalonians. And it paints a radically different picture here um, of the Christian life. Look what it says. 1 Thessalonians, and you've heard these verses before. But it says, be, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17, 18. It says, be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. All right? So here's the deal, guys. So often... We get caught up in what we think are the important things that we miss out on what God says is important for our lives. For example, I read back in Matthew chapter 6 where Jesus was clearly teaching about material things and he asked the question, why do you worry about these material things? And he asked the question because Everybody's worrying about material things. He says, he, he asks, why do you worry about the food you're going to eat? Why do you worry about the clothes that you're going to put on your back? He said, the pagans run after those things. They pursue those things. They, tr- they chase those things. And he says, your heavenly Father knows that you need them. And he calls them out, the whole lot of them that are listening, the thousands of people there on the Mount of Beatitudes. He says, you got so little faith. And he's talking to his own disciples. That's who he's really he's talking to, first of all. And then there's the thousands that are listening to him as he's talking to his disciples. The, the group of 12 there, right? And, and he says, you have so little faith, and he's challenging them, you know? There is no true spirituality without faith. That's the thing. You know, I was thinking about this yesterday, how many times I've run into people who have told me, oh, I'm not religious, I don't go to church, I'm spiritual. Have you heard that before? Have you heard that? Next time I hear someone say that, I'm going to ask them this question. Is it possible to be spiritual and have no faith? And turn it around. Think about that question, okay? Is it possible to be spiritual and have no faith? And then get the question going. Because, you know, so often as Christians, we hear those things and we, we, we you know, it's, faith is such a, we, we don't know how to respond when we hear things like that. And people are asking the same sort of questions nowadays as they were 2,000 years ago. They just ask them differently. Jesus said very clearly in Matthew 6, he says, but seek first, in verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you. And then he says in verse 34, Stop worrying. Don't worry. Let God take care of it. That's God's problem. Now, to me, when it says seek first his kingdom, when Jesus was challenging you and me to seek first his kingdom, he's really saying seek first the king of the kingdom. Can you have a kingdom without a king? Right? He's challenging you and me to seek. For, this, is, this is what it means to seek first the kingdom. It means seeking the king. To me, seeking first means seeking the giver, not the giver, you know, the gifts that the giver can give you. And that's what we do a lot of times too in our thinking. We want the gifts. I want this gift and that. And we get motivated, and I understand all that. But Jesus is saying, seek first the kingdom. Seek first the king. Seek first the the giver, not the gifts. To me, that's what we're to seek. The one thing that is the most important thing, and that is God himself. And God makes a... uh, He seems to just almost rebuke his own people in Matthew 6 when he says, you know, how can you possibly worry when you know God wants to do this for you? And God promises us that if, you know, we pursue him he's going to take care of these things because we're the ones that are important to God but when we don't make God important to us and we say God you're not as important as these things it's we get very confused as Christians so going over to first Thessalonians 5 take a look at these verses guys and this is a simple message this morning and uh, a short one Uh, when it comes (coughs) to God's will And I say this is not a formula, but if you (laughs) seek to do these three things, the rest will take care of itself. And it's so simple, the Christian life, even a child could understand what I'm saying this morning. It says, be joyful always. Be joyful. After all these years of being a Christian, over 30 years, 35 years, over 35 years of being a Christian, I am still trying to implement this in my life. Do you know that? Um, I want to be a joyful Christian because that is not my natural makeup, all right? uh, I'm just kind of like steady Eddie, all right? 
People say when I smile in a picture, I'm not smiling. I don't know. I don't understand it. If you've seen me on Facebook before, they go, and I'm saying, I'm smiling on the inside. I don't know why it's not going through the flesh and coming across with sunbeams and all that sort of thing. But guys, you know, this is something to this very day I'm still we're learning. And now look, it says, be joyful always. Be joyful always. A better translation, and some of your translations have this, is it says, rejoice always. Now, if you don't know how to be joyful always, this is how you are joyful always as a Christian. Rejoicing in the Lord. Rejoicing in the Lord. <clears throat> Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. That's actually my life verse. All right, That's my verse in life. God has challenged me to grow in that area. Psalm 37, 4. We like to rejoice in earthly possessions. We like to rejoice, and it's like Christmas, man, for all of us, except it's 365. We love getting the new car, the new house, the new clothes, and it's like Christmas morning. You unwrap all that stuff, and it's an empty feeling as soon as the wrapping paper hits the floor almost, isn't it? It's just that quick. And we all go, it's like, oh, all the hype, and then you feel bummed out and empty. But here's the deal again. People like to rejoice in the material. We like to do it. As Christians, we do it. And God calls us to rejoice in Him. God calls us to delight ourselves in Him. And it's, notice, his, look what it says. It says rejoice or be joyful. How often? Always. Actually, be joyful always. Pray continually. All right? Do you see that? And do you notice? <clears throat> Give thanks in all circumstances. I'm going to address that in a bit here. But here's the deal. Again, we're at the end of the year. This wasn't a leap year. It was just a regular year. It was this is the 365th day of this year. What have you done with your time? <laughs> what have I done with my time? Think about this. Don't beat yourself up about it. Don't get down. But I ask myself, what have I done with my time? What have I done with my energy? What have I done with my schedule, my calendar? All right? And, and this is a good, I love it when uh, Christmas Eve on a Sunday falls, you know, it's, it's or, not, or New Year's Eve, yeah, it falls on the, it's the 31st here. It's a Sunday morning. This is a good time to take stock. Always. All right? Rejoice always. What does that look like? Well, in the morning, I get up. At lunchtime, in midday, I think about it. I, 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 I think about rejoicing in the Lord. In the morning, as soon as my, you know, I open my eyes, I think, okay, rejoicing in the Lord. At night, before bed, rejoicing in the Lord. It, it, there's this idea of singing songs, of delighting in Him, of actually saying this verse back to Him and saying, Lord, You've told me to rejoice in you. You've told me to delight myself in you. I'm doing that. I'm seeking you first. Something as simple as that. You don't have to, you know, do anything fantastic or weird or strange or dramatic or anything like that to enter into these verses and apply them to your life. When I do this, it trains my heart not to delight in the earthly material things. The pagans run after these things. You and I are called to run after the Lord. The pagans delight in these things. You and I are called to delight ourselves in the Lord, to rejoice in the Lord. The pagans rejoice in these things for a short term. And then they go on to the next thing. And you and I are called to rejoice always, pray continually. Then the next one, look at ver the next verse here. I, it's very simple. You guys could probably memorize these, th these three verses by the end of the message. Pray continue, or rejoice always. Be joyful always. And then verse 17, pray continually. Pray continually. Man, I don't know. When I read that, I'm thinking, I, 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 can't, I can't pray continually. Like every single moment of every single... Can you do that? Nobody can do that. I once try to imagine what it would be like to talk to God 24 hours a day, seven days a week, nonstop. And I thought, this, what does this verse really mean? And then I met someone who told me this is how they apply this verse. And it kind of made sense to me. This is one way that we can be obedient to this verse. All right? 
He said, throughout the day, you know what I do, Ed? It's like I just shoot up prayers to God all day long like an arrow. And I, I got that picture in my mind of taking a bow and arrow, and it's like a prayer, just all day long, just casually shooting up prayers all day long, all throughout the day, people not even knowing that it was just a simple thought, a simple prayer addressed to the Lord, all right? And, you know, when you open your eyes first thing in the morning, just thank you, Lord, for another day. Help me, help me today, all right? Just thanking God for another day. Breakfast, Lord, be glorified in my life today. Thank you for this food. Leaving the house, God shine through my life. Going to a meeting, meeting someone, Lord, help me go through this meeting. Missing the bus, going to the meeting, Lord, help me get to where I got to go. Help me not to grumble and complain in this situation. Meeting a person you weren't planning to meet, and it comes across as an interruption, it's like, okay, hold on here, Lord. Interruptions are opportunities. Lord, open a door for me to talk with this person somehow, some way. Constantly shooting up arrows to heaven, all right? And, and he talked about how he would do that all day long, and he prayed continually. And it's called practicing the presence of God. So it's a, it's, it's a term that's used sometimes within the church practicing the presence of God. And it's not trying to get God to love you more. It's not trying to get God to accept you more. It's not trying to get God to sort of be with you during the day because he'll be with you more during the day if you do those sort of things. You know, when I come to church Sunday morning, I'm not trying to get God to do anything. Now, back when I was in the uh, Pentecostal church, uh, there was this constant kind of like, oh, we got to, we got to get God to do something here. You know, you just got to sing songs, a certain, you know, a certain over and over repetition and this and that. And, it, and you're trying to get God to do things. And it's so works-oriented versus grace. And it's just not them. There are a lot of church organizations do that. A lot of churches do that. I'm not trying to get God to do anything because God has already done everything for me on the cross and through the resurrection. It's called grace, right? And so when I come here on a Sunday morning, I can't get God to love me more. I can't get God to accept me more. That's not, that's not what it's all about. It's about opening your eyes to the presence of God around you. And so praying continually is this, is this way of chasing after God, pursuing God, who's always with you anyways. All right, so look, let, let's just continue on here. I'm running out of time. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. Now, Pretty much every Bible translation says give thanks in all circumstances. It doesn't mean give thanks for all circumstances. There are some situations, some tragedies that we don't thank God for. You don't see an earthquake on the television on the morning news and say, oh, and people who've died in that, and you say, thank the Lord for that earthquake that killed people. You don't say that, right? But, you know, there are Difficulties that when I go through, I can thank God while I'm in the midst of those difficulties. I don't necessarily thank God for them. I thank God in them. All right? So we don't thank God when bad things happen to other people. But there have been many times in my life where I went through a trial, a tribulation in my life, and I just thank the Lord in the midst of them. You know, there have been dark, discouraging times in my life where I felt like everything was going wrong, and so I started to thank the Lord. And instead of feeling like things were dark, you start to feel like just, you know, the, the light of God starts to shine on you. I do know that when I complain, I feel like dark clouds are over me. But when I start thanking the Lord, I, you know, you feel just the light of the Holy Spirit shining upon your soul, all right? There are times in my life where I start thanking the Lord and it starts to set my soul free from heavy burdens. And look what it says here. Give thanks in how many circumstances? All circumstances. All right? I remember the one time where I had a tremendous breakthrough. It was about, must have been, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago. I was driving my Hyundai Accent. Not this one, but the, the, the one I had before this. And I drove through this parking lot that was abandoned, car dealership. And uh, there was a black asphalt parking lot 
except there was this one area that had a green piece of grass about one foot or two feet by two feet. And I just happened to swing my car and I was driving over it. And I'm thinking, you shouldn't drive over that grass. But I thought, it's just grass, no big deal. What's what's a square piece of grass growing in the parking lot? So I drove over it and I didn't realize that's where the lamp stand used to be. And there were four bolts sticking up out of the ground in the grass. And I hit my transmission pan. And as soon as I hit it, you know, it's like everything becomes very clear, right? <laughs> like you think you're an idiot. You, you, sh- you, 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 sh- you were thinking not to do it. You did it. How many times you have to do this in life to listen to the inside voice, all right? So I remember I stopped the car right away. I jumped out. I look out. It's all pouring out and all that kind of stuff. And my normal reaction would be what? Negative, get mad, get frustrated, right? But I looked at it and I thought, okay, First of all, Ed, you are an idiot. But number two, Lord, I was just teaching on something like this to other people. I'm going to start thanking you, and I'm just going to say, okay, I, I can get mad and blow up and really just live in that cloud, or I can just start thanking the Lord, and I can just lift it up to God and pray for God to give me strength. And I did. And, you know, Later on that day, you know, I got a ride. We came back later. I took some JB Weld. We stuck it on the hole. You know, you know, it was like, it was crazy stuff. But it, it all worked out. Put some, some transmission fluid in it. Drove around that car for a couple more years. Not a problem with it at all. All I'm saying is this. It was a tremendous breakthrough for me at that point to do that. And I didn't feel spiritual while I was doing it. I felt so unspiritual while I was doing it. I felt so angry and frustrated, but I just started to thank the Lord. And afterwards, I realized what a tremendous, tremendous, powerful breakthrough, like a life-changing experience. And I've taken that away. And I'm still trying to learn that to this day to do it. But, you know, you, you, there's times where you just have to step out in faith and apply these things to your life. All right? Guys, listen to me. Give thanks in all circumstances. I challenge you to do that in the new year. Things where you would normally get mad, angry, frustrated with. Try it. And at the end of the day, see what the difference is. Another verse I didn't get you to turn to, but you can jot it down, is Philippians 4.12. All right? Philippians 4.12. In Philippians 4.12, Paul says, I have learned the secret of being content. By the way, I want you to stay in 1 Thessalonians 5, okay? But I have learned the secret of being content. And he says, whether in need or in plenty, whether hungry or well-fed, I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. And he says that in verse, it's a be- powerful, wonderful verse. Because Paul's talking about how he has been hungry, how he has been naked, how he has been persecuted. But he says, I have learned the secret to being content in those situations. But he also says the flip side. He says, I've been well-fed, I've been prosperous, I've had things going my way, but I've had to learn the secret of being content in those situations as well. And I would say that's probably the biggest challenge for most of us, is being content not when we don't have stuff, but being content when we do have stuff. But then the kicker goes on in verse 13, and he says the famous verse that we all love to quote, he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I've heard that sermon, I've heard that message taught so many times and quoted so many times in sermons where, you know, it's like, well, you can do amazing things. This is the beginning of a new year. Go out and, you know, shake the world and leap to tall, you know, tall tall buildings, walk on frozen ice, you know, whatever it is. I don't know, something like that. But the, and it's always quoted out of context. The context is this. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. All right? Paul was saying, I can be content in every single situation I find myself in. I can do this through Christ who gives me strength. And if there's anything you want to apply to your life, it's a verse like this. Whether you're well-fed or hungry, God can get, I can do this. I can be content in these situations. All right? If you have a lot of money or you have no money, if you have a lot of food or no food, God says you can be content with your situation. 
not happy with this, not happy with that. You fill in the blank. Everybody's got something. There's not a person here this morning that doesn't have something that you can't fill the blank in with. All right? You can put something in there. Now, what's amazing in Philippians 4 is that, you know, he does say this. He says, he, he says earlier in Philippians chapter 4 the same three things that Paul says in Thessalonians. He tells the Thess- the, Paul tells the Philippians in Philippians 4, he says, stop being anxious, stop worrying. He tells them rejoice always. He tells them to pray and he tells them to give thanks. The very same things that Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And he says, The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Give thanks. Stop your complaining. Stop your worrying. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. All right? Listen, when you do this, you are living at the center of God's will. I usually like to do things on a whiteboard a lot of times, you know. I draw circles and stick men and all that kind of stuff. You guys are used to that. But, you know, if I could put a circle with a bunch of other circles and call this the will of God, Scripture, that is a command. Rejoice, always pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. That is always at the very, very, very center. And if you acted on those three things, guess what? The other things like guidance, I don't know what job I should take, I don't know what kind of course I should take, things like that, those things start to reveal themselves they start to make themselves clear to you once you act on the things that you do know clearly all right seek first the kingdom and all these things will be given to you don't be like the pagans who are always worrying don't be like the pagans who are always complaining don't be like the pagans who are always chasing after other things these three important things living at the center of god's will rejoicing praying giving these things are the things that Put you in the place where God could start to work in you and through you. In all circumstances, thanking Him and trusting Him. Another one of my favorite verses at the end of this year, I'm just kind of freestyling this morning with some of these verses, but Romans 8.28, it says God works all things out together for those who love Him. God works all things out for good to those who love Him. And I often say when things go wrong for me, I look at it and I go, you know what, according to Romans 8.28, God says God's going to make this work out. And I say, Lord, I can't wait to see how you work this out. Because I can't imagine in my own mind how anything good could come out of this situation. I can't imagine one good possible thing. And I've been in those situations once in a while. But then I say, Lord, I want to see how you work this out. Because you kind of, you promised that you would. I look forward to seeing how God, and then you just say, thank you, Lord, for how you're going to do this. Another great verse is in Proverbs. It says, God directs, God orders the steps of a righteous man. And I believe that. I think, Lord, guide me, direct me. So when people come to me about whether th- you know something is God's will for their life, I take them to these verses. I don't know about things like you know whether they should choose this job or that job. Um, or whether they should move here or there, or whether they should buy this house or that house. I can give them my own experience, you know, my own wisdom on a certain level, but, you know, God sees everything from his perspective looking down. Um, I do know if people live out these verses, that they will be at the very center of God's will, and that God starts to work things. God starts to speak to you in your life. God starts to move in your life. Look at First Thessalonians chapter 5 again. And very quickly, look what verse 19 and 20 say. Do not put out the Spirit's fire, or don't quench the Spirit. Same thing. And then verse 20, do not treat prophecies with contempt. These need to be taken with the verses ahead ahead in context. Don't put out the Spirit's fire. Don't quench the Spirit working in your life. Every year at year end, I ask, Lord, what major lesson do you want me to learn? Or what, what major lesson have I learned this year? And I ask myself that, Lord, what, remind me of what uh, you have taught me this year. And you know, last year, God spoke to me about some certain things. This year, do you want to know the one thing that God taught me this year? I already know it theologically, but the one thing that God really just revealed to me in a personal way, that he just kind of made real to me it's this 
The ever-abiding presence of God. What do you mean by that? Well, let me share real quickly. Number one, God is always with me. I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit. God is inside of me. He's joined His Spirit with my Spirit. He'll never leave me or forsake me. All right? So God is inside of me. But then on top of that, I'm immersed in God around me. What do you mean? It says in Acts, In Him we live and move and have our being. In Psalm 139, and let's turn there. Psalm 139. It talks about the presence of God being absolutely everywhere around us. Psalm 139, verse 7 says this, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths of the... You are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Verse 11. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like day, for darkness is as light to you. Like a couple months ago, I just, this thought came to me with like dazzling clarity. There is nowhere I can go to get away from God's presence. And I know this is nothing profound for anybody here this morning, but when that really became real to me, there is nowhere that I can go. Like God's presence is right here in front of me, right here where my hand is. It's here, it's here, it's here, it's here. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. And I can't, there's nowhere I can go. And, and, and for the longest time of my life, I thought, you know, you know, let's just invite God's presence to be here. All right? And I know what God, people are asking. We're asking God to manifest himself, to work in our hearts. I get that. I don't run people down when they act, they talk like that in their prayers to God. But, you know, you don't have to whip yourself up and convince God to show up. The real challenge is this. The real challenge is opening your eyes and seeing that God is here right now. And there's actually nowhere you can go in this entire universe except hell where the presence of God cannot be found. That's what Psalm 139 says. There is nowhere that you can go where the presence of God is not there. So if you feel like God is far away from you, that's because that's how you feel. That is not the reality. And I thought, wow, this changes my prayer life. It changes how I see God. And the real challenge is inside of me. And I thought, you know, it says quench not the Spirit or don't put out the Spirit's fire. Am I yielded to the Holy Spirit? Am I surrendered to the Holy Spirit? Am I opening my eyes by faith to see the Holy Spirit? Do I walk around with expected faith or am I just walking around in the flesh, guys? All right? Think about this. God's presence is right here. You could talk to Him as if you were talking to a friend who was right in front of you. And that takes faith. And then look what it says. 1 Thessalonians 5. It says, don't treat prophecy with contempt. You know, prophecy, I used to think prophecy was, you know, meant where one person was speaking another person into a person's life or there was a personal word of prophecy into somebody's life or, or as a group, somebody spoke in a, in, a, in a voice that said, oh, my little children, listen to me and things like that. But listen, prophecy, the definition of the word prophecy means to declare the counsel of God. The word prophecy means to declare the mind, the thought, the will of God. And this is what this verse means. First Thessalonians chapter 5, I've read, I, verses 16, 17, 18, 19. But then verses, these, other, these last couple of verses here that we just read. Don't treat prophecy with contempt. When God speaks to you, listen. When God speaks to you, receive it as the very word of God. God wants to talk to you. God wants to minister to you. God wants to break through into your life. But the th question is this. Are we living in the place where we're not receiving? Are we living in the place where we're quenching the Spirit? Are we throwing our wet towel on things by not rejoicing always, praying continually, give thanks in all circumstances? I think that's the fuel. I think that's the fire. I think that's, those are the things that put us in a place where God does speak to us, where we do sense God being all around us. Rejoicing always in Him, praying continually, giving thanks in all circumstances. Now, as I hand this new year, 2018, I can't believe it's 2018, all right? Like, 
I'm still f- stuck on 2000. You know, why 2K, all right? I can't believe we're in the 2000s, never mind 2018, right? But I'm going, wow, Lord, you know, this year it's not about trying harder, doing better, just a little bit more, ooh, and God will just love me that little extra. No, it's not about that at all. It's more about my life being surrendered, yielded to the Lord. It's more about, you know, realizing the presence of God is always around me and stop running after the things that pagans are running after. Start running after the Lord. Start pursuing the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we come to you right now. We bless you, Lord. We praise you. And Father, we're at the end of a year. And uh, I ask myself, <laughs> like at the end of every year, what, what have I done with my year? And as I go into a new year, Lord, I'm not all about making resolutions and I'm going to this and that, but I do pray, Lord, that you would challenge me and stretch me, make me uncomfortable with where I'm at now. And that I would rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, that I would not put out the Spirit's fire, but that, and that I would receive the word of the Lord, how you want to speak to me. Open my eyes, Lord, to see how you're always around me. I can't get away from your presence. I could run to the end of the earth, but you're there. If I'm in a plane 40,000 feet in the air, you're there in that plane. If I'm at work or at home or in this building, you're there, Lord. There's nowhere somebody could run to get away from you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would just speak that to our hearts this morning, that, Lord, we would understand what it is to pray to you and to fellowship with you and to pursue you with all our hearts. And that, Lord, we would learn what true godly contentment is all about. That we would understand what it is to be in the center of your will. So, Father, we thank you for this last year. We look forward to the new year in faith, with expected faith. We look forward to the breakthroughs that you're going to give us spiritually, emotionally, physically, Lord, socially, financially. We look forward to how you're going to bless us with how you want to bless us. So thank you, Father. And now, Lord, as we go our separate ways, we pray that you would bless us and keep us. Lord, make your face shine upon us and be gracious to us. Lord, turn your face towards us and give us your peace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.